Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we return to our study from a couple of weeks ago, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly and correctly understand that which is written in Scripture for our edification? Shall we now seek his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We come before you now knowing that there is not any one of us that can stand before you except for Christ. For we have all sinned, that we have all fallen short of your glory. We ask, Father, for forgiveness of our sins. We ask as well for, that your spirit may guide us so that we may become unified, so that your word may be given both in spirit and in truth to this world before its end. Help us now as we open your scriptures. Guide us so that we might more clearly understand that which we need to know. Be with us now. Direct us, we ask. We thank you for this time of study. We thank you for those that can join with us now and for those that will join via the Internet. May your angels surround us, protect us, and help us to understand what you would have us to know. And may your spirit open our minds and our conversations. Help us to this end. Direct us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Last week, we spoke quite a bit about numbers dealing with the 2300-year prophecy that we find from Daniel 8 and the revelation that we saw in Daniel 9. Now, here we're going to be returning to our study in Ezekiel. As it is before you, Ezekiel 9.6, slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. Is this presented for us today to literally perform? Is this a literal instruction to us? Not at this point. Not literally. Okay. As we continue through this, there are several points that Sister White made that we need to consider. Now, from Manuscript 11, 1868, beginning in paragraph 8, a non-published document, we profess to believe that the end of all things is at hand. What does it mean to profess? What does it mean to profess to believe? You gotta believe it. You gotta live it. Would it be a better way to say that we are giving lip service to believe that the end of all things is at hand? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. What manner of persons, the apostle inquires, ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? James James exhorts us, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and let your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself at the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James would impress us that this condition of mind is more appropriate for the times in which we live than to be seeking friendship with the world and engaging in the folly, the levity, pride, and vanity which worldlings are engaged in. We are exhorted to humility. Instead of possessing a boastful self-confidence, the opposite is becoming believers in present truth. Are we here to lift up self? Is that where our salvation will be found? Well, we lift up others to Christ. Okay, we lift up others to Christ. Any other thoughts? We're to die to self and lift up Christ. We have to work on ourselves. Like uh, Often lately the Lord has been given me, what is that to thee? Follow thou me, you know, regarding judging other people and having to cope with other people because it's really problematic at times. Okay, here again, she continues. Christian cheerfulness is not condemned by the scriptures, but reckless talking is censured. Those who live in the last days should be circumspect in words and in acts. Sobriety is more in accordance with our faith than levity. Those who realize the solemnity of the times in which we live will be among the number who bear about them a weight of solemn influence. 
What does this mean to you? Are we to be able to recognize where we're living right now and what at what time we are living? She continues. They are rich in good works, bearing the burden of souls, and by holy example, faithfully represent Jesus Christ and win souls to accept Christ as their Savior. Ezekiel 9, 3 to 6. Isn't it interesting in this chapter that is seen as such a huge condemnation of the church that she shows that there will be those that are faithfully representing Jesus Christ and that are winning souls to accept Christ. Notice particularly the sighing and crying ones alone are marked. Those who have engaged in afflicting their souls before God are especially remembered of him and the angel is bidden to place a mark upon them. First Peter 5, 5 to 9. So in this situation, is Ezekiel the prophet in agreement with Peter the apostle? Does this not help us to understand that all scripture is in agreement? Satan and his host are arrayed against the saints of God, and the armor must not be laid aside for a moment. Our only safety is in being instant in prayer on the watch every moment. There is no release admitted in this warfare. It is a constant battle for life. Here she quotes, 1 Peter 3, 10 to 13, Colossians 4, 5 to 6, Ephesians 4, 1, 2, and 3, along with Ephesians 5, 1, 2, and 4, Philippians 4, 8, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and Matthew 5, verse 9. The truth received in the heart and carried out in the life will correct the erring. Does this help us at all? Yeah. Yes, it does. I keep praying that the people, some of the people that I am uh, associated with will receive the truth in their hearts. Because so far, some of them are rejecting it continually. Some of them are receptive to it. And some of them are, no, well, this is what I've been taught. We need to reexamine the scriptures. You know, we need to take the word as it says. Okay. Let love, affection, tenderness abound in your heart. You possess fortitude, courage, firmness of purpose. You can, when you see the necessity, control your words. Study the effect of your words, whether their influence will be saving upon others. Never talk for the sake of talking, but for the edification of those who hear. Your heart has loved the truth and those who believed it. You are a lover of hospitality, and these excellent traits qualify you to exert an influence that will be saving upon others. But for the lack named in this letter, which counteracts it all and greatly injures your usefulness, I commit this to you in the fear of God, entreating you to lay these things to heart and to bring forth fruits unto righteousness, that at last you may hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, Matthew twenty-five twenty-three. The Lord has blessed you with a kind, true, God-fearing husband to aid your efforts in the right direction. Now, in the original testimonies, before they were placed together in an omnibus, testimony 31 is written as follows. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, cause every man, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. These next these next sentences are all taken from Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6. All of this is what we had studied a couple of weeks ago. Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary to put on the garments of vengeance and pour out his wrath in judgments upon those who have not responded to the light God has given them. Let these words settle for just a moment. If Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary, if he is no longer to stand before the mercy seat, pleading our case before our heavenly father, has the final message of mercy gone out? Is there going to be another time of probation once Christ leaves the heavenly sanctuary? 
second chance. I couldn't hear you. Sorry, you, you're not coming through clearly. Uh, no second chance. No second chance. When Christ leaves the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary, what is he doing? He's fixing to come back and get his saints. Okay. There's something even plague, simpler. Seven than... last plague there about to... Yeah, the seven last plagues are about to be full when he leaves the mercy seat. Okay, but there's something simpler I'm looking at here. What is Christ doing at this point in relation to the mercies? Interceding for us? Uh, I'm sorry, brother, you did not come through clearly there. He's interceding for us. Correct. But is he not facing the mercy seat to intercede for us? How can he be before the mercy seat if he is not observing the mercy seat. And if he's going to leave the mercy seat, is he not turning his back on the work of the mercy seat to leave the sanctuary? Has he not done all that he can? Yes, he has. Exhausted every, he's exhausted every avenue, you know, try to reach the loss. Okay, I, I think I heard you right, Brother Jeff, that he has exhausted every avenue? Yeah. Okay, so if he's exhausted every avenue, if he is leaving the mercy seat, if he is putting on garments of vengeance, and now he's giving the instruction to pour out his wrath in judgments upon those who have not responded to the light that God has given them, where are those judgments going to fall first? Well, the house of the Lord. Exactly, upon the house of the Lord. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. Exactly. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11. Instead of being softened by the patience and the long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the truth strengthen their hearts in their evil course. But there are limits even to the forbearance of God. And many are exceeding these boundaries. They have overrun the limits of grace, and therefore God must interfere and vindicate his own honor. Is this not an example of God taking the work into his own hands? Are we currently vindicating God's character before those with whom we come in contact? Of the Ammonites, the Lord said, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Ammonites is not yet full. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner, that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the fourth generation. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. With unerring accuracy, the infinite one still keeps an account with all nations. Does God have a record of our individual lives? And if so, is this a true and correct record? That's a number of hairs on our head. Is this the kind of record that we wish to have seen by all of those around us? While his mercy is offered, while his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, the account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount, which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. There is no more pleading of the mercy in their behalf. So, if the figures must reach a certain amount, is this saying that when the symbols have reached a certain amount? No, this is referring to numbers. This exactly. Number of people. Yeah. We have a certain, a certain account for ourselves. All of us do. And when that, when those figures are exceeded, where they are fixed, when they reach that point, God's ministry of wrath will commence. There is no more. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. There is no pleading of mercy in their behalf. The prophet looking down through the ages had this time presented before his vision. 
the nations of this age have been the recipients of unprecedented mercies. The choicest of heaven's blessings have been given them, but increased pride, covetousness, idolatry, contempt of God, and base ingratitude are written against them. They are fast closing up their account with God. Do we wish this to be said of us? But that which causes me to tremble is the fact that those who have had the greatest light and privileges have become contaminated by the prevailing iniquity. Who is she referring to here? Us. Exactly. Influenced by the unrighteous around them, many, even of those who profess the truth, have grown cold and are borne down by the strong current of evil. The universal scorn thrown upon true piety and holiness leads those who do not connect closely with God to lose their reverence for his law. If they were following the light and obeying the truth from the heart, this holy law would seem even more precious to them when thus despised and set aside. As the disrespect for God's law becomes more manifest, the line of demarcation between its observers and the world becomes more distinct. Love for the divine precepts increases with one class, according as contempt for them increases with another class. This crisis is fast approaching. The rapidly swelling figures show that the time for God's visitation has about come. The ledger is showing that we have about reached the point where God will tell his son the message of mercy is done. So although loath to punish, nevertheless, he will punish and that speedily. Those who walk in the light will see signs of the approaching peril. But they are not to sit in quiet, unconcerned expectancy of the ruin, comforting themselves with the belief that God will shelter his people on the day of visitation. Far from it. They should realize that it is their duty to labor diligently to save others, looking with strong faith to God for help. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Are we praying as we should? Are we working as we should? Are we studying as we should at this time? Ministers and people see that they have not sustained the right relation to God. They see that they have rebelled against the author of all just and righteous law. The setting aside of the divine precepts give rise to thousands of springs of evil, of discord, hatred, iniquity, and the earth became one vast field of strife, one sink of corruption. This is the view that now appears to those who rejected truth and chose to cherish error. The language can express the longing which the disobedient and disloyal feel for that which they have lost forever eternal life. Men whom the world has worshipped for their talents and eloquence now see these things in their true light. They realize that they have forfeited by transgression and they fall at the feet of those whose fidelity they have despised and derided and confess that God has loved them. Fourth Spirit of Prophecy 472. The people see that they have been deluded. What does it mean to be deluded? Uh, Lukewarm. It does mean to be deceived. How can we not be deceived? Example. For example, always kept in contact with the Father through prayer and His Word. Well, obeying obeying God, obedience. Yeah, that goes with it. Yeah. What is God's law for us? Is it not a wall protecting us, showing us where we should walk? Here again, the people see that they've been deluded. They eagerly accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Why? As Mrs. White continued, 
Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things, and they have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false watchmen, the very ones that once admired them the most, will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that will be done. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons to whom the command is given. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, and come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary, says the prophet. They began at the ancient men, which were before the house. The work of destruction begins among those who profess to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false shepherds are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. So this passage from the fourth spirit of prophecy, being very direct, is showing that the angel of death is being typified by the men with slaughtering weapons in their hands. Is there any other way that we can we can approach this? The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, 21. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor. And his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Zechariah 14, 12 and 13. In the mad strife of their own fierce passions, and by the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath, fall the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers, and people, rich and poor, high and low. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. Jeremiah 25, 33. Letter 10, 1888. Unless you change, you will constantly erect barriers around your children to hold them away from Christ. Brothers and sisters, those of us that are parents, do we wish to have barriers holding our children away from Christ? You will bind them with the world because it pleases their carnal minds. When the angel with the writer's inkhorn places a mark upon those who love Jesus and keep his commandments, another angel will follow with destroying weapons in his hands, and the commandment will go forth, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. <clears throat> will you not carefully look at these things and think upon them? Will you not, for the sake of your children, do the work for which God has made you responsible? I feel greatly burdened over these things. The children of Sabbath keepers who have had their own way and who have been gratified in all their wishes will, in consequence of their selfishness, idolatry, and unrighteousness, be unfit for heaven. But they will be fit for the last plagues. Unless parents arouse from their present condition, and do their appointed work, they will perish with their children. In this, in these portions, we should also be considering Great Controversy, 1888 edition, 
along with great controversy, and we will find these on page 656, paragraphs 2 and 3. Now, Manuscript 3, 1895. Let no one think that he can trifle with the privileges that have been bought with the blood of the only begotten Son of the infinite God. We are responsible as servants of Jesus to be all that we may be by becoming doers of his words. So we need to be doers and not just hearers. In the day of final account, we shall be judged by the standard of what we ought to have been and what we ought to have done. God is speaking to the Sydney church by his word, by the message which he is sending. And will anyone venture to say, as did Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Exodus 5, verse 2. The word of God will judge a few, right? No. Thank you. The word of God will judge everyone. I present the fact to the Sydney church that many of you have not walked in the light as Christ is in the light. You have not represented Christ to the world. What are you going to do about it? God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. In these hours of probation, you are individually deciding your own destiny. We read that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And at first, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. Here again, Sister White repeats Ezekiel 9, 4 to 6, in combination with 1 Peter 4. When the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, he will take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, where is vengeance first to come? Where is judgment first to be poured out and meted out? On the house of the Lord. Exactly. But what is that saying then about those, the ancient men, if vengeance first comes to them? In ancient religious men? I'm speaking of this time. Well, the oh, elders, those, are the, those are like the elders. <clears throat> oh. By the way, that speaker is much better. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I had it on Bluetooth speaker. It didn't work out too good. Okay. Now, the point that I'm driving at, the point that I'm looking at from what I've just read here, if God will take his vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that vengeance first comes at the house of God, to the elders, then do they know God? And are they obeying the gospel? We must study for ourselves to understand what the gospel truly is. We don't want these figures in the columns that are applied to us to be tallied to say that you have reached the number set by God. It is then of the highest importance that we search the scriptures to know what saith the Lord, in order that we may be doers of the word and not hearers only. Those who know not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ are those who have the Bible in their possession, who know that the only begotten Son of God gave his precious life to make it possible for them to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, and yet who have neglected the word of God. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Second Thessalonians 1 9. God holds men responsible for obtaining a knowledge of him and of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Does membership within the church hold any advantage if we will not seek to know Jesus Christ and if we are unwilling to seek for ourselves to obtain such a knowledge. No. Membership, uh, membership doesn't help. Okay. In the prayer of Christ just prior to his crucifixion, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, 
that thy son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee as the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What a saying is this? How full, how deep, how comprehensive. There is no excuse for those who will persist in remaining in ignorance of God and of Jesus Christ. What has she said here? I'll put it this way. There is no defense for those who will persist in remaining in ignorance of God and of Jesus Christ. Willful ignorance. Yeah. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I interrupted. You say you're saying willful ignorance? Yeah. No. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've had people tell me, I'm a good person. If there's a God, he's going to recognize that. And if there's salvation, then I will be saved because I'm a good person. Is there anyone that is good according to God? No. No one. No self-righteousness. Well, the problem is we don't recognize our evil. Okay. There is no excuse. There is no defense for those who persist in remaining in ignorance of God and of Jesus Christ. Those who do remain in ignorance remain so at the expense of the loss of their souls. Can any of us afford this? Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. Oh. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Can we afford at any point to be ignorant of the character of God. Certainly not. Now, this Review and Herald article, published May 21st of 1895, was published on the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year, 5940. We're going to have quite a bit to discuss in this article. We've not had much conversation within this study. What points... Have we addressed today that are being brought home to you regarding the verse that we started with at the beginning of this session, Ezekiel 9.6? What else do we need to address at this time? I'm going to go backwards just a little bit. Now, from what Mrs. White wrote, is the slaying of the old, the young, maids, little children, and women is this to be a work that is going to be literally done by members of the church? No, it won't be done. Agreed, no. The message that, it's a message that uh, does its work. It's been asked of me, when is this message then going to go out? How soon is this message going to go to all the world? Is this message to go out before Christ leaves before the mercy seat? Has to. I agree, it has to. But there are those that, that are giving smooth things, sweet words, and saying, oh, Christ is never going to do this. He wants us all to be saved. So all we need to do is just accept his name, and that's it. All we need to be is hearers of the word. All we need is Jesus and no doctrine. Right. Is that what these passages have said to us today? Definitely not. We now need to decide. Are we going to be hearers of the word only? Or are we going to be both hearers and doers of what is being shown throughout Scripture? Each one of us has a whole lot of work to do. I'm sorry. I think it's supposed to be both, the hearers and also the doers. Okay. Thank you, brother. Brother William, what were you saying, please? I said we all got a work to do, and we got a short time to do it in. I agree. So, this coming week, 
we have a lot to consider. Over these last several weeks, we have been seeing many presentations on the symbolic use of numbers. Very interesting. Okay, from the chat, square root of 5940, the biblical year when this article was published that we will get into this next week is 77.07. We're going to have a lot more to talk about this in our next section, in our next, next session, excuse me. Consider carefully how we may more properly represent Christ with all of the, those that we are coming in contact with. Consider what has been being presented on the symbolic use of numbers before the numbers in our individual columns are total. Because once they reach the point where God says no more, that's it. Just like it was with the Amorites. Just like it was with the Amalekites. Just as it was with Babylon, Media Persia, and Greece. When their time is fixed, their time is done. May this not be said of us. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these warnings that you are providing us, for these admonitions that we need to consider. Help us now that we may listen and be blessed to understand that which you would have us to know. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Help us that we may become, as you would have us become, of your righteous, so that we may walk in the path of your righteousness to represent your character before all of those with whom we come in contact. We thank you for this time together. We pray for your blessing upon the meeting as this continues. We ask your blessing upon Brother Theodore as he presents. Help us now and guide us. We ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.